who don't know me, I'm Carla Krim, Horticulture and Natural Resources Educator for CCE of Delaware County. And it is my absolute pleasure to um, welcome you to the Horticulture Track today. Uh, this is the first time we've really integrated both um, growing of flowers and growing of vegetables um, with a focus on marketing and soil health. So things that are important to all of us. Last year, if you'll recall, we had separate uh, flower and horticulture tracks, but this year we really brought um, some great speakers together that's going to give us information that will help all of us. So my first speaker to welcome is Betsy Bush, who is also uh, my co-coordinator of this track. She's actually done most of the work, I want to say. Um, so Betsy is the owner of Spongetta's Garden in West Winfield, New York. Um, she has her business. It's very interesting model where she grows across different fields uh, near her area and not everything's right at her home. So the name garden is a little bit misleading, but uh, she's actually a Delaware County native and has been helping us with flower farming pro programming for going on what, two years now, a little over two years. Yeah, so, and she's gone on to speak many places who just, um, spoke at the Thriving uh, Farmer Flower Conference, which was great. And, um, but she's gonna, um, even for the best of us, things can go horribly wrong. So she's gonna address some of the um, questions that have been raised to her recently and how um, she's been nimble and dealt with these issues. So welcome, Betsy. Hi, thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm glad everybody's here. Um, and we're just gonna get the slideshow going. Okay. Does she have to hit share again? I'm sorry, guys. We're still yep. figuring that out. Yes, that's it. Yep. <laughs> so Carrie's helping me out with the slideshow and the technology, and hopefully between the two of us, we'll get it. And Kenyon is um, on dog wrangling duty right now because Charlie was at my feet chewing a bone, so which is always helpful. All right, well, thank you so much, um, everybody, to take your time with me today. And this, as Carla said, this basically, um, this presentation happened because people were asking for it. They're like, what do we do in this situation? Um, how do we respond? How do we be nimble? Um, what do we do to prevent things? And then really, when you've lost 600 glads, how do you recover from that? So um, some of them, there are some great ways we can recover from. And sometimes the answer is just to move on. So I wanted to share with you some of the challenges I've had over the last six years. Um, starting with, we had a microburst in our town that took out 23 trees on my street. So I have areas that were shade gardens that were suddenly no longer shade gardens. So they were filled with perennials and I had to move things quickly um, over the years and kind of reassess what my gardens were. And then last year, um, we had a microburst up on the hill, very, very isolated on the edge of town, and it knocked over my sunflowers. And we'll talk about that later. Um, I had thrip damage that took out 600 glads last year. I did everything right, and it was rainy and cold, and of course they took them out. Um, a couple of years ago, I actually had three weeks of way too many flowers, and um, desperate of where do I sell them with not having my market set up. Um, and then last year I had an interesting one. I didn't have anything round for about three or four weeks. Um, my zinnias were taken out by Japanese beetles and then, um, and they hadn't bounced back yet and other things. So I actually went to Carrie and Kenyon's place and picked zinnias from them, um, because I didn't have anything to put into my bouquets. Um, and it was, I had spikes, I had fillers, but I just had nothing there. And then um, I did this my first year, I committed to 300 sunflowers and I thought I understood succession planting. Um, so I direct seeded them and the birds ate most of them and the grass overtook the others. And I did not have enough sunflowers for this event and had to go buy them. Um, times where all stems, on one side of the field because of a nutrient issue perhaps, um, we're a lot shorter than the rest of the field or it could be a cold issue, all those different things. So um, last two years ago, was it? We had no rain for five weeks and I don't have good irrigation set up. 
And then kind of the last one that I've been dealing with, and this has been going on for a while, is I hurt my right knee. Um, actually, it's been an ongoing issue. And I can't carry anything super heavy, so I can't do vegetables anymore. I cannot handle a bushel. Buckets are fine, but one of the tests that's huge, especially with perennials, is being able to dig, and I cannot do that motion with a shovel anymore. So I have to recover from that and find people to, I have to ask for help, which is often the hardest thing that we do. Okay. It's taken a second. Try it again. Oh, it skipped on. Sorry, we have a um, little bit of slow internet connection here. So what I, we got this. All right, so what I really wanted to do, hold on, I need to, there we go. There's something popped up on my screen that wouldn't let me read my slide. So we wanted to find what's good and bad as if it's all black and white and it's not. Okay, a good year is when you grow both personally and professionally, build your customer base, find your niche, expand your niche, um, enjoy positive cash flow. Um, you're expanding infrastructure, refining markets. Um, everything is growing. And personally, then we're more confident and we're willing to take on more risks. A bad year is a year when um, it's usually a whole bunch of little things happen. Um, we can survive one or two things, but when we start having um, a cascade effect of bad things, it just brings us down. And you know, when we can't deliver what we promise, um, we're losing customers because we're inconsistent. We don't have it week after week. We're not at market week after week. Um, when you're spending so much more than you're bringing in, it all leads to burnout. So one of the other things with that, the positive side of that is when bad things happen, we do learn and we do grow, but we have to get beyond that. And we have to balance this good and bad. So I did want to talk about one thing as we're going to be talking about both vegetables and flowers. And I just want to talk a little bit about how um, the science behind how the plants grow. So when we're harvesting herbs, most of the time we're doing those in the foliage stage. And from there, the plants bloom and that's the flower. The flower needs to be pollinated if we're making a vegetable, fruit, or seed. Um, flower farmers, we are cutting those before that pollination stage because we just want the flower. We want the flower to last longer. Um, if we're growing vegetables, fruit, or things for seed, then we want them to keep going through that cycle. So just keeping that in mind as we're talking about these various things is sometimes we have to catch them at different stages. There are different issues involved um, in how we're harvesting things. And it's so true, no plant is the same. So we learn things in groupings, I think, but there's still always exceptions to those groupings. Okay, so here we are. This is, I'm going to take you through, I think I put in 13 scenarios. Um, basically this idea of, okay, something happened. So let's talk about what the circumstance was. Let's talk about how we're going to prevent it. What is our immediate reaction to it? And then what's the plan going forward? And most of um, the time, the reaction is nothing more than clean up and move on. Um, sometimes there's an action we can take at that point. Sometimes we just have to cut our losses and move on to the next thing. And the biggest thing is prevention and always having um, new crops ready to go uh, when something does go bad, getting things planted and succession planting saves us both in vegetables and flowers. Um, the other thing is one year is not a trend that, you know, something happens like here, thrips on the glads, um, like the thrips on the glads, go ahead and stay there, it's okay. Um, thrips on the glads kind of took them all out. I did ended up not spraying on that property. So I cut them all down, got them cleaned up, pulled, made sure I pulled the bulbs so the bulbs were still on the ground when we rototilled next and then I moved on to the next thing. Um, that was my third succession. So I had already gotten two good successions before that one happened. Okay, so this is my first scenario. 
all good. So my first scenario, oh, back one, you jumped ahead on me. There we go. Okay, so this was my, oh, Charlie's back. My dog, Charlie. Okay, so my first year, um, I very, I had a bunch of stuff in a fence. I very optimistically did three successions of gladiola in this kind of weedy patch, um, had hay down for mulch. And the first week, you know, it's always the yellow. Second week, it's always the salmon. Third week, I was so excited to walk from the barn. I had my pails, I was ready. And I get to the patch and this is what I see. There was absolutely no color in this field at all because deer had come and they chopped the tops and then they chopped where it was beginning to bloom um, on the sides and they took out all of the glad, like hundreds of them. Um, so this was my first experience with really understanding having to control deer and, um, you know, had to create barriers. Now I always do my glads in a fence. Um, I actually didn't in one area last year and they got me again, not as bad. Um, but it's totally disheartening. And the problem with the situation and with glads, or if we were dealing with tulips, is that these are single stem, one flower plants. So they're not gonna come back. We had the same thing happen. We did a squash tunnel and uh, they came and trimmed that for us. But because we had all indeterminate plants, branching plants, um, it just basically trimmed them back and then they grew more. So um, kind of the same thing with that is, I had glads take out zinnia one year. Well, you know what? About half of those zinnia, even though they went down to the ground, half of those zinnia came back because they were branching. They have one job and that is to flower and seed. So they were trying to do their job. So sometimes you can bounce back from the deer, but the important part of that is understanding um, when you need fencing, whether it's from deer, rodents, or rabbits. Um, so what kind, how high, how dense. Um, if you're planting tulips and you're having um, bowl issues, um, digging your trench and then putting in um, chicken wire and then planting them on top of the chicken wire so they're almost in a cage, one way to save them. So understanding what those different options are for those barriers. We use three different kinds of fences. We have the big metal fence, um, the galvanized one. We also have um, two locations that are more temporary. So we just use the deer mesh and we move those around. So one thing I wanna say is um, as far as understanding what's safe and what isn't, or mostly safe and what isn't, um, Rutgers has a great list. It's the deer resistant list. You can just Google it. And um, that's a really, really good one to um, work off of. And at least it's a good place for us to start here in the Northeast. And I know we may have some people from other parts of the country. I am gonna be talking today mostly um, based on my zone, which is 5A, um, my we have May 20th and October 1st for our frost date. So we're kind of working within that. So if you're in another area, just kind of shift it um, as I'm talking. Okay, um, again. Okay, so another one that we get stuck with here, anybody who's ever tried to grow asters knows that they look beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. They're doing great. And then all of a sudden they're not. And what it's, is is asters yellow and um, it's spread by leaf hoppers which migrate from the south and it's one of those diseases that once they um, are infected um, it's done you're not going um, to be able to recover from it and so once you see it it's too late so basically the idea is we need to protect the plants physically from the leaf hoppers so until they get to the point where they are flowering um, the idea is to keep them under row cover um, for that time. And it does work until it doesn't. Um, so it's a lot of work for one flower that I like but don't love. So I have decided I'm not growing it anymore. Um, but I do have a theory about leaf hoppers and Japanese beetles. Um, Carrie and Kenyon do not have the amount of pressure with those that I experience here. And I think it's because they're more open and they have the wind coming through. 
And where I am, I'm more sheltered and I don't have that. So I'm having more pest issues because they just hang out. I don't know if that is true, but it is definitely something to think about. Okay. Okay, here's a fun one. Um, our entire area, um, every yard pretty much has bishop's weed or gout weed. Gout weed is the green version. Bishop's weed is the variegated. It is a ground cover that's related to Queen Anne's lace and it spreads by rhizomes and it is nasty and awful. Um, and it was originally introduced to gardens as a nice um, ground cover. And it's, kind of, it's a bad one, it's taken over. Um, so what's happened in our area is we have a perennial sale and people have moved it from garden to garden until the entire neighborhood has it. Um, it chokes out everything else. We tried taking it out with silage tarp um, all it did was just keep going with the rhizomes and then wait it until it could come back again. So it doesn't, um, it's invasive and it's not something you can really work with. I actually had compost, not thinking about it right around it. So it got into my compost. So if I used the compost, I would have moved it to another location. So not even able to use the compost. Um, Basically, the only option for this one is hand weed to maintain. There's a bunch of others. Japanese um, knotweed is in a bunch of areas. And, you know, so flowers with perennials, but also thinking about fruit, of dealing with things that are invasive that are going around, especially berries. So, you know, keeping that in mind for anything that's perennial, you need to keep these things out of that area so that your plants are the ones that win all the nutrients and not the invasive weeds. Okay, so here's another one is direct seeding and then it gets buried under weeds. And this picture is my sister-in-law's garden where she tried to, um, it's a little later in the season than emerging with this idea. But any of us who have put direct seeds in, waiting for them and they are just completely overtaken by weeds before you see the little plants, before you can do anything to save them. And my goal in life is to never hand weed because when you do and you're pulling things by the roots, you're destabling the plants that you're trying to save. So um, it's this idea of cultivating and beating it out. So when we direct seed, we need to do it in long straight lines. We need to mark it well. And even before those seeds emerge, we should be at least once a week going through and um, cultivating around that row so that you are getting those weeds at the thread stage so you don't have to deal with them when they're bigger and you need to pull them out. Um, I think one of the ones that it's really tough on is dill because it does get so tall and we're all kind of using it, whether it's for pickles or for bouquets. And um, that's one of those, it needs its roots so that it can stay upright. So if we're weeding around it, we're just destabilizing it. Um, when we are planting direct too is, I always go for over sowing rather than under sowing and then thinning. And I think that's one of the hardest things people have is um, that idea of being able to pull out those little baby plants that you think will be something great one day. But if you keep them all in there together, it's not going, none of them are gonna grow to a good plant. So it's really important to thin. And sometimes we're not gonna thin by pulling. It's better to just cut. So, and that's back to the, um, so true with the dill is as you're kind of weeding around dill, maybe it's better to just cut around it. Okay. Okay, so this is a big one, especially for flower farmers who are doing um, hardy annuals is when we wanna go out with those beautiful plants that we started, we have them hardened off, it's May 1st or you know middle of April and we cannot get out there and till our land. It's too wet to do anything. So what the trick on that one actually is, is prepping those beds in the fall. And I do 200 foot rows each um, fall so that I have them in the spring. And, you know, just, I put the plastic down and then leave it. And then when I come in the spring, I just put my holes in and plant right into it. My ground's heated up a little bit. So I have some more, time on it and that works pretty well. Um, if you are in the situation um, this spring and it is wet, of course you have to do hand till to get them in there. One thing that we can do is put things into nursery beds. 
and that's one solution I put on the slide, is that um, I have a bunch of perennials out front that are basically in nursery beds to get them over the winter, and then I'll move them in the spring to their actual location. Sometimes we might have to move something in the spring. Um, we'll get it in the ground, get it going, and then get it into its permanent location in a couple of weeks. Okay, this happens. <laughs> I mentioned this already. Um, we had, there was nothing at my house. And this property is a quarter mile from my house up on the hill. And uh, when we got up there, there was a tree completely split. Um, and it turned out there are a bunch of other trees down and I got to the garden, lost part of the fence, but the big one was the sunflowers just went like that. Um, I had read um, Pamela and Frank Arnosky talking about this happening in Texas where they went and they um, then put their sunflowers back up. So I said, well, let me try that. And I went through and I literally took them all and I propped them up on themselves and they were still a little wonky. But what happened was I had, um, I, don't, I think I put it on here. Yeah, I had um, five different plantings, so five different days to harvest. So the ones that were about to bloom, I didn't really save because they were like this at that point. But the ones that still had some growth going on, they actually straightened themselves out, grew up with beautiful straight stems and the sunflowers were fine. Um, and I still got about two foot stems on them. So that worked out really well as far as it's possible to recover from it. But the other thing that I really wanna say is we always need to have more seeds, more seedlings and more plants ready to go into the garden than we're gonna use. And I know the lean principles say not to waste like that. On the other hand, if you have something like this happen, you need to be able to go through, clear that, get it replanted and move on so you have sunflowers and you know the next six weeks after that i do want to that's cool i do want to say one thing on that is um the damaged plants were more susceptible to disease so i had a lot of leaf issues at the, that point um that you know happy plants grow happily and plants that have been beaten up a little bit um have a little bit of a harder time so i just expect that you can recover from it. You may not get the best plants after. Okay, so here's one that um, in my consulting work, I have a lot of people asking me about strawberries. So it's important to understand how a strawberry is grown. Um, they're a perennial plant. You put them in the ground. They grow all summer long, then go dormant, and then they um, pop up in the spring in June, and then they um, immediately flower and produce fruit or almost immediately. So all of their growth actually happens um, after the fruiting period for next year. So one of the things that people are so tempted to do is, oh, I want strawberries. I'm going to fertilize them in May. And that is not when they wanna be fertilized. They wanna be fertilized after harvest. Um, for the next year. If you do it in May, um, you're gonna have glorious, um, pretty plants, but you're not gonna have the berries. So it's understanding um, how the plant's gonna be formed. And there's the same thing with so many of the, um, both biennials and um, perennials that bloom in June, it's that same idea. So after they've bloomed, we wanna get them fed so that they're um, doing all of their growth for the rest of the summer, and then they're really happy for next year. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is we have a tendency to pair things together um, by when they bloom, but not necessarily what they want. And a lot of times we will put asparagus and strawberries together, but they're like opposite. As far as like soil needs, acidity, um, water needs, all of that, they're totally different. Um, so we have a tendency to put them in the same thing, but they don't want to be in the same place necessarily. Okay, so some things that are premium but low yield, and this is the idea of vigor. So here we have helicotta squash, and I also brought straw flowers. And um, these are two great examples of plants that um, don't give you a lot, but they're worth growing anyway. Um, I think 
and they get a premium price. And it's always interesting because people discover delicata and they're like, oh, I want to grow that. And then they grow it and they only get two squash per plant. And then they're like, what happened? This isn't really great. Or the other thing is this is a delicata that's been on my counter. They don't really store well. I really shouldn't still have this. Um, so there are certain um, storage crops, um, certain things that are for longevity um, that it may not be that one. So understanding what our premium crops are, making sure we're putting that price on them um, and having people still excited about it but knowing that in your own garden, they're not gonna be like crazy. Um, like straw flowers really are not a pretty plant. They're long and gangly and um, produce a little bit here and there. And I've not had great luck pinching them to get more shoots. So you get what you get from them is how I feel on both of these, but you have to enjoy them while you have them, so. Okay, so here's a big one. We were just talking about this, beating the rain. So first and foremost, having a radar on your phone, um, having the weather apps, more than one weather app on your phone so that you can see what's going on and you can anticipate what's coming. Um, when rain is coming, the first thing we need to do is to go to our Lysianthus patch, our status patch, and to our tomatoes because those are the three that are gonna serve as, um, the most damage from the rain on them. Get those out first and then kind of deal with the rest of it. Um, if you look at these Lysianthus, it's two different kinds of damage on it. The bottom one, it was open and it ended up with speckles on it. The top one is even worse. It was in bud and um, it's just crinkled, dry all the way around all of those petals. Um, both of these things make these ones you can't sell because they are damaged. Um, status, it just melts down in the rain. Um, if it's hit rain, it's done. And basically for dealing with these two is just going and cutting them um, because they will pop up again in the fall and you'll get a second flush at least. Um, but they are not sellable this way. Uh, tomato crack kind of goes back and forth. Heirlooms, it's a little bit charming. Others, maybe not so much. Um, definitely split cherry tomatoes are not sellable. Okay. Okay, so here's another one is not having the right things at the right time. Um, pickles, having, um, you know, the pickling cukes, the dill and the garlic all at once. Of course, the garlic's ready here um, early um, July, it almost like January, um, early July. And then crop planning for seed heads for dill. Um, if you're doing the seed heads, it's 85 to 105 days. And cucumbers take 55 days. So we have to plan that out so that we have them at the times that we need them. We start the dill inside, so we have a little bit more time on them. Um, so this requires understanding succession planting and what your varieties want. So I just went to the Johnny site and got those numbers for the days to harvest. Um, knowing where to find those, knowing how to work with those. Um, and then you're also beating disease on this as far as um, if you're trying to keep your cucumbers going to catch up with the dill, you're dealing possibly with powdery mildew and, and all the different bugs that um, are associated with that too. So um, this is succession planting. It's having um, replacements available, but it's also planting things when you know that it's gonna work out so that you have them together. And it works for bouquets too. Okay. Okay, this was heartbreaking. Um, customer came back to me, bought a bouquet and came back and said, yeah, it just all wilted. And what I realized happened was um, it was eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and that particular bouquet was right by the window. So even at eight o'clock on a Saturday, the sun can take something out. Um, and it was absolutely awful on the way to market. Um, immediate reaction when somebody comes with that is, um, I'm sorry, let me replace it. Because you're not gonna argue with them. Um, it's not their fault. Maybe it's their fault, but it's still not their fault. And um, we need to keep our customers. And anytime something like that happens and we're honest with our customers, um, we've actually built customers for life. And that's what this woman said was once I explained it, took care of it, probably apologized way too much uncomfortably. Um, 
but she said, okay, yeah, you have a customer. So that's a good thing. Um, another is, you know, I just put up the picture of the not watered bouquet and just explained to people what happened there. But the biggest thing, the like prevention and the reaction on this is both customer service, but it's also knowing and following our post-harvest care protocols um, that we're aware of what the heat can do to a flower, that we're um, protecting them at all stages. And most of the time when there's a problem, a customer's not gonna tell us, they just won't come back. And I think that's true for all of us. Okay. Okay, here's another one we deal with a lot with our CSA um, is customers not showing up, especially on the weekly schedule or the bi-weekly schedules worse, um, is they don't come to pick up their bouquet. They get busy, they forget, they drive home. Um, so one of the things from my side is I need to set time every week to keep myself on schedule um, so that it doesn't change every week of what time it's actually going to be ready. Oh, it's four this week. It's six this week. Oh, it's going to be Thursday morning. Um, we do, we're small enough. We are, we're under 20 CSAs that um, we do send text messages to each person. And it's actually become part of Harmony's job, who is my driver, of um, before we get everything loaded up, she knows where she's going. She sends all her um, text messages and then hits all of the houses. Um, and that's worked out great, actually. And in a weird way, that's worked out better because it builds, strengthens our relationship with those um, customers. And those are special customers because not just purchasing the bouquet subscription, but they come to us for other things as well. Um, in the village, my customers who are in the village, um, I actually give them access to my cooler. Um, so they just know they can walk into the studio, there'll be a note for them on the cooler, they'll take their bouquet, sometimes I give them a choice, sometimes I tell them what they're taking, and it works out great. And it's helped for me to not have to um, be there all of the time. Um, I used to wait for everyone and like I needed to go do something else on a Wednesday afternoon. So this has worked out pretty well. Okay. All right, the empty bucket. Do I go to market this week? It's a tough, tough choice when you don't have enough. You need to be consistent at market um, and with the retails, but sometimes, especially in June, sometimes in July, you just don't have anything. There's like a weird week. Um, so it's important to kind of set priorities of who's going to get the flowers that week. Um, my CSA is always first. My stores are second. Market's third. Um, my number in my head is um, anything less than $140 in sales. It's not enough for me to go to market. Um, a good week for me is $400 or more. That's what I like. Um, so you have to set your own numbers, whatever they're going to be in that stage of how much does it take for you to show up? So it's that crazy, crazy balance of which way on that. And then how do you get the word out that you're not going to be there um, so that you don't have people just showing up and then not having anything. Um, what I have done in the past is send a bucket with another vendor and then um, they'll sell them for me. So they will, we will at least have something at market, um, but I didn't have to go through the rigmarole of doing it. Um, and then crop planning always saves the day. Um, weather happens. Um, you know, just we try to do this balance. We're always trying to, you know, play this, especially as flower people. We have so many balls in the air making bouquets because there is so much stuff involved in it. Okay, next. Okay, I'm too tired to work. And this is. Um, when we get sick and um, you know, how do we survive that? A lot of people, I, I think Lyme disease is just hitting so hard um, people after people. Um, it's a tough recovery. Um, sometimes there are chronic symptoms, you know, there's the prevention of it, it's a treatment. I actually had a crazy thing with, um, I came down with shingles and I was wiped out for three weeks and exhausted for six. And that came to the question of, do I have people trained well enough that I can send them out to my fields, have them in the studio, make my bouquets, send them to market? Do I have people who can do that for me on days I can't do that? And that's kind of my long range planning, um, my long range training, 
um, and kind of figuring it out of, okay, who is willing to do that? Who can do that for me? Okay. Okay, and then we're coming to the end. And this is all about um, life balance. So, you know, it's like a sprint. The season is a sprint. It's like, okay, for me, May 1st happens. Boom, I'm going right, 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 right through into um, December with dried flowers. And it's been running, 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 running. And um, just getting things done and just keeping moving. And sometimes we're so busy that we're too busy to plant or, you know, do these various things. So the more we have it taking care of ourselves, the better we can do that. Um, I'm always chasing that extra thousand dollars. That's my number. Um, like I'm planting extra sunflowers for that, or I'm doing this or that. Um, and then the other thing is taking time every week to plan, to scout, to train everyone. As I said, with the last one, um, Monday mornings are my, I go out to the fields and I'm by myself. I have nothing else going on. I have my notebook and I'm observing and I'm writing things down because what I'm doing, I'm not thinking like that. So I need to take that two hours for myself every Monday and make sure I'm doing that with everything. Um, and then just back to when things go bad, this picture is, um, I had just planted sunflower transplants there, believe it or not. Crazy rain came and completely washed the whole thing out. Um, so it's like, it's clean up and move on. Unfortunately, I had some more, um, fortunately, I had some more um, seedlings going. So just two weeks later, I could get them in the ground and we still had sunflowers. Um, so it's always having something ready to go. When things go bad, clean up, move on analyze it, but remember that one year is not a trend. Um, last June was way too hot and um, hardy annuals were not happy. That doesn't mean that they don't do well for you. Um, give them another year and see what happens. Okay, questions. I've got one for you here, Betsy. Um, okay. Can you explain a little bit more about nursery beds? how they are prepped and how they protect the flowers and which flowers benefit most? Okay, that's a great question. So when I mean by a nursery bed, I'm just taking a little portion of a row or a field, tilling that up, um, making sure it has the fertilizer, um, compost, whatever I'm using in it. And instead of planting um, plants at their regular spacing, usually nine inches for me, um, I'm actually putting them in very, very close together so that I am taking up as little space as possible, but I have these plants into the ground. We'll plant them, grow them for over winter or for a few weeks, whatever we're doing with it. And then we're gonna move them at that time to their permanent location. So we're making like mini beds basically. I think, did I get all parts of that question? Let me know if I didn't. And I'm not seeing any questions in my chat box, but that doesn't mean they didn't go to yours. I have a feeling that last one just went to Corinne. So um, if we haven't addressed your question, uh, please post it again or uh, direct and we have And Kenyon's right here if you have a vegetable question. So if I can't answer it, he should be able to. I think the only part of that, and maybe you answered it, Betsy, and I missed it, but which flowers benefit most from nursery beds? Okay, that is a good question. Okay, um, first of all, ones that don't benefit from it are ones that have tap roots and don't like to be um, transplanted in the first place. So you don't wanna like put them in the ground and then move them and then move them again. So I would, Larkspur would not be happy doing that. Pennycrest would not be happy. Um, you're doing things that are not as worried about their root disturbance. So things that can take it. Um, Celosia don't do it too because um, they'll revert to short ones. Does that make sense? So it's less than I can give you a list um, than it is, hey, don't do it that way. They have Charlie penned up and he's whining because he can't get to me. So that's my dog. Okay, anybody? The only other question I have is, um, are, are folks gonna have access to the recorded presentations? And I am happy to report that yes, they will. Um, we'll get them up on our website uh, as soon as we can. But that's the only question I have right now, Betsy. Okay. 
I just want to give uh, folks a reminder, there is a link in the chat for a session evaluation. So if folks could take just a minute or two to fill that out and give us your feedback, we would really appreciate it. And feel free to email me or send me messages if you do have questions, of course. So. Wonderful. Okay. Any other just general, now's a good time if you have any general flower questions, because uh, Betsy has lots and lots of answers, has um, taught a lot of classes for us. I know we have about uh, 15, 20 minutes before the next talk starts. So uh, this is the time to pick her brain. And I will say also, Carla and I are working on a schedule for some sessions um, in February and March. So we're working on that. We don't have anything to announce yet, but hopefully we will in the next week. So we have a bunch of good ideas. Yep, and we're open to suggestions as well. So yes, absolutely. You know, contact us and um, let us know what you're looking for. We know we have uh, a few people now who are in what their second or third, uh, even fourth season of flower farming here in Delaware County and beyond. So um, we're really excited to support that. And of course we have our vegetable farmers who have been here a long time. And uh, we all share similar challenges, struggles, um, so yeah, so I know we have some new folks in the group as well. So hopefully now they've gotten a glimpse of what they might be in for. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Where are we on time? I lost that. We are at, I have 1042. Oh, okay. So we've got Kenyon oh. coming on at 11. Yep. Um, so so we'll take a little break. If people think of things to ask, let me know. And... Alrighty. You're welcome. Some, some notes of thanks in the chat for you. Um, there is one more question. Do you fertilize sunflowers? And if yes, when in the growing process? Okay, I only, I broadcast my fields for when I'm um, planting and that's the only time I do for the sunflowers. Um, I don't do them right before they're, harvesting i don't know enough about that to tell you that that's a good thing or a bad thing um but with sunflowers they don't really need they need that boost for growing but then once they are big and flowering they don't need as much i think so i didn't answer your question um uh, well, but i just about sunflowers. i'm sorry to interrupt yeah but, please do uh, they're you don't really, and Betsy can speak to this more than me, but if you're doing bouquet work, for example, you don't necessarily want huge sunflowers. They can be too big. In fact, a lot of ours last year were too big to be useful to us. So, um, you know, more fertilizer would have just made them more gargantuan. <laughs> so there's yeah. ways to keep them petite um, with your planting strategies and uh, fertilization, I think. So that we're, we kind of uh, neglect them a little bit, I think, on purpose, right, Betsy? I think so. Yeah, you really, um, I don't want anything bigger than a five or six inch sunflower. So, um, and when, especially like growing in the fall and you have the ones that kind of revert and are really tiny, they're so good for um, bouquets. So you just, you know, I get what I get and I make it work. Absolutely. And um, you might want to even mention too, like that you introduced me to this last year, the horizons that are upright versus the ones that are forward facing, just depending on your goals for your arrangements. So yeah, when you're using sunflowers and a bouquet that's in a sleeve, you want, when you're looking down into that sleeve, you want everything to be facing up so they can see it. Um, if you're doing something in arrangement, maybe you can work with the side ones. So for both um, dahlias and sunflowers, um, they come in kind of different angles. So having the upright ones are really helpful. My favorites are the Horizon because they look, they're, um, they end up being kind of small, but they look like a traditional sunflower, the petals do. Um, I do like the Orange Excel, but they're fluffier. They're all a little bit different, um, but yeah, Horizons are my favorite. Okay, and there are some questions about your favorite flowers and best flowers for beginners. Okay, so um favorite flowers are well i love the cosmos is always going to be my favorite um my favorite ones to kind of work with i do like cosmos for centers and bouquets um i love amaranth i love a lot of the spiky things um not a big fan of the snapdragons but i love stock um 
snapdragons always seem to lose their petals. So it, getting them before they're pollinated is always really tough. Um, but yeah, I like the spiky things. Stelphidium, absolutely love both the column ones, the Pacific Giants, but I also like the more open um, Belladonna type. So I'm thinking if there's, I will tell you guys, I keep getting in trouble for this, so now I'm saying it all the time. There is something I don't like, and that's Dara. Um, I think it's a muddy color, and I think everyone else loves it, and I'm the only person on this planet who doesn't. So, okay, best ones for beginners. <laughs> um, best flowers for beginners are definitely the tender annuals that bloom and um, August and September, and a lot of those are the ones that will keep going. Um, so of course it's Zinnia, um, Cosmos, Sunflowers um, are all pretty easy. What's interesting on those three is they're easy to grow, but they're a little bit harder to handle in post-harvest. So there's some things you have to pay attention to. Um, like Zinnia, if you get them too early, um, you have to do the wiggle test. And if their heads bob, um, they're not ready to go. It's more like swaying like Axl Rose as you want them to be stiffer. Um, otherwise they will just droop um, after harvest and then they look horrible on a bouquet. So um, those are those, I think I'm afraid are pretty easy to grow. Um, status as a party annual, that's an easy one to grow. Stock is pretty easy as far as starting it. Um, those are fun ones. Yeah, I'd say that um, for the things we grow at Birdsong, zinnias are always an absolute hit and never seems like we have enough. So next year we're going to be growing more and um, and not just the big well, like banaris or banaris. I never know if that's how I'm it's still going. not sure. <laughs> so uh, I think it's it's banaris, the, the big fluffy dahlia like ones. Those are great focal flowers, but there are also so many great little ones that you can plant. I know Betsy loves Oklahoma Ew. and um, that jazzy mix. I think it was Miranda who grew it last year. One of the folks here grew it and had it at the Walton Market and it was just so cute. And so I've actually added that to my lineup for this year. But, um, and they are easy. And the funny thing with zinnias are like, you can start them inside what, you know, six, four weeks before the season, but they're just as happy if you direct seed them outside after risk of frost. And, um, you know, I planted them from transplants and seeds side by side, and those little suckers from seeds catch right up to the ones I transplanted. So even though That's you cool. feel like you're getting a leg up, you're really not. Um, and it seems like the ones that you um, transplanted are actually more susceptible. So, and also you might want to speak to like timing your colors for the season. Um, that was one of the things I failed miserably on as far as I had a lot of wines and burgundies early on. Um, and not enough in the fall. And then vice versa, I had all these like really light cutesy things in the fall when people were after organs. Absolutely agree on that. This was the first year that I thought I did that pretty well. And then once my zinnias caught up um, and my most successions after, I had a great fall of zinnias. So that was wonderful. Um, oh, big grief on the favorite list, Celosia. Everybody should be growing various kinds of that. That's really fun. People love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Amaranth too. I kind of see those. Yep. Amaranth. So yeah, uh, that's another one. I definitely have my favorite list. Um, I'm trying to think. I do my gardens um, because I'm driving around so much. I do them by timing. So things that are going to uh, bloom in June and July are in one location. And then I have a summer like August location, and then I have a fall, September, October location. Um, there's a little bit in each of them, but it keeps me from driving around like crazy. So I'm trying to picture my different gardens of, oh yeah, I do like that. So. <laughs> and of course, and I, I did, never have enough foliage either. That's um, never have enough foliage. Is to grow all the pretty flowers, but um, I yeah. fall in love with that mahogany splendor that you suggested. It's a hibiscus actually. It doesn't really ever go to flower. Um, right, I like that one. Beautiful maple leaf foliage that um, is dark and kind of moody, perfect for fall. And what would, what's your favorite light green foliage? Green foliage. Um, mine is Anna's Hyssop. I had to think about that. Mountain Mint, yes, I agree. 
that mint's wonderful. Oh, it's so um, amazing too. Yeah. Upright, unlike your other mints that kind of crawl around. Um, the other mint, it, I, or, I also or, love um, apple mint. Um, the fuzzy leaves, and that's pretty much the only one of those herbs that you can um, harvest before it flowers. Most of the time with an herb, you have to wait for it to flower. Otherwise, it's going to um, just will. It's not going to hydrate. Um, that's one you can do a little bit earlier. So, and it takes over. You have to put it someplace where you're just going to let it go. Those are probably two favorites. And then also I have a neighbor who has a bank, huge bank of Solomon seal and he lets me cut from that. And that gets me through the month of June. I love it. Yeah, those so. early season ones are hard to yeah. come by. I yeah, love uh, Baptisia for that because it kind of looks like eucalyptus and holds it. Which one? By. Baptisia. Yeah, that you one. got me hooked on that. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. And then the Cosmos greens, we used a lot of yeah. those. And Cosmos does so much double duty on all of that, that um, especially when I am in the, I harvest my long stems or as long as I can get, and then I strip them in the field. And I always make sure on Cosmos that I leave lots of um, greenery because that acts as an extra filler. So. All righty, well, let's uh, give these folks a quick break. And then okay. we'll meet back promptly at 11 o'clock for uh, Kenyon's talk on roadside stands. Perfect.